being poor. They're tired of praying and waiting for something that they believe won't ever happen. Mm -hmm. So uh, these guys' situation makes no sense, especially to somebody from this part of the world. How could you do something like this? But then again, you did something like this, but you started trying to bury it. Nobody here wants to talk about slavery. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to talk about the real racism that still exists. But for a third world country, they'll condemn it. They'll talk about them as if they were lower than an ant's poop. <laughs> so, uh, is Nigeria a third world country? Uh, they still are. They still are. Uh, they got. I didn't know. I'm, I'm, they I was got just a asking. Lot of money. Uh -huh. Africa's, Africa's got a lot of money, but you got certain areas in the continent that still is poor. Then you got some of them that's very well off. Mm -hmm. uh, these people, uh, lawlessness is, is, is running them up. Lawlessness. Lawlessness. Uh -huh. um, I can't thank her the poor, but uh, he said in any given society where there's no discipline, there's chaos. And that's what's happening. Look around this world that we're living in. It's stuff jumping off everywhere. And we're so close to ending it that I don't think a lot of people really recognize it. What do you mean we're so close to ending it? Ending the world. Hmm. Ending the world, you got nuclear weapons in the hands of fanatics. Mm -hmm. You got fanatics in the lands of people that's oppressed, can't do nothing about them being there. Mm -hmm. Al Qaeda and you. They've been there for a long time. So, you just got a lot of stuff that's going on, even in Ukraine. Supposedly mm -hmm. civilized people. Mm. Supposedly civilized people, and you see what's happening to them. They're about to light the torch, and that's that genie you certainly can't put back in the box. So let me let me try to summarize your response to. So the, so the original question is, what if anything do we think the abduction of the Nigerian schoolgirls has to do with? the portrayal and projection of Jesus, either ancient Roman times white Jesus or the contemporary American dominant view white Jesus and this uh, black Jesus that, that we have been trying to reclaim here at Abyssinia for the past couple of weeks. And your, 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 what I've gathered from your response is, hey, it doesn't really have much to do with the Nigerian girls directly because the Nigerian girls Studies, studies have reported that, that Nigeria is predominantly, well, there's some tension between Nigeria's Muslim community and Christian community. The people who have abducted these young girls are part of a, a Islamic extremist group, Boko Haram. Anybody unfamiliar with this? Unfamiliar with this story altogether? Okay. Yeah, because I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I even said something I'm about it Sunday. Huh? I'm watching this Yeah. It's and, yeah, well, you know, it wasn't on the news right off. No. Right. Okay, but but again, back to you that that that's that's a disconnecting point, right? The the, the concept of Allah, to use your term, the concept of Allah versus the Christian concept of God. I want to make sure I address that, and also that uh, there that that Nigeria is a third world country, and. The situation with Ukraine is interesting because you're, you're bringing up how lawlessness run amok is, is, is evidence that we are living in the last days. I mean, that's the way I've heard it for so long. And that you think we're right on the cusp of uh, ending the world because world, people got nuclear weapons and all this other stuff. 
and then you bring up Ukraine, and Ukraine is supposed to be a civilized place as opposed to Nigeria that's supposed to be a relatively underdeveloped place. This is interesting. And so with all of that, I think it's just you're saying, uh, we don't really want to talk about it in America because we don't like to talk about slavery. Absolutely. Okay, got that. Okay, cool. Anybody else? Do you see any connections between black Jesus, white Jesus, uh, Nigerian schoolgirls being abducted, and what we've been talking about for the past couple of weeks? I, uh, I see Jesus. Mm-hmm. Not black, not white, mm-hmm. but uh, I have to and I might be way back in time, is that I was taught that he has no hands now. Yeah. But our hands. Mm-hmm. He has no eyes but our eyes. Yeah, no hands but mine. No and, eyes. Yeah, that's the song. Mm-hmm. And what we uh, uh, ex- what, what, what we are at is that we just pray that the people that are in charge mm-hmm. of the people that are superior make the right decisions and do what they're supposed to do. Yep, so it took the American government a while to respond, even though John Kerry said they have been in conversation with the uh, federal agents in Nigeria from the day that this happened. This happened around April 14th. Uh, and so you're saying our responsibility by and large is not to focus on whether or not Jesus is white or black, or what that connection is. Let us be in prayer that the governmental <coughs> officials, both in America and in Nigeria, make the right decision. Yeah, okay. Anybody else? Let me try to connect some dots, at least for me. And then I will uh, try to respond to may- maybe what I'm about to say would at least to some degree respond to some of what you all have just lifted up. Good evening, come on in. Good evening. So I, like I said, I, I, was, I was thinking on ways to connect this. Because for me, I, I felt like it was something there. I always feel like it's, it's something there. Um, I was wondering, I'm wondering how, if all, the reclamation of a black Jesus could impact our inspiration to revalue black life instead of devalue black life. I think the reason that we haven't heard much about it or that we didn't hear much about it right off, talking about the Nigerian girls and trying to connect uh, them to our understanding of Jesus and faith and what this means for us. A little bit to Emma's point about the impact of slavery that we don't want to talk about. We don't want to talk about how slavery has produced a concept amongst most Americans, regardless of our race, that black life is expendable. I think we all know 200 plus young white girls in Ukraine or any other part of the globe go missing at once, it's not going to take a lot for the media to give it major coverage. It's not going to take a lot for the American government to respond with force. And the reality is we are a little bit ambivalent because it is so commonplace for young women of color to be sexually trafficked. One, one uh, scholar, Dr. Tim Conhouse, my homeboy from uh, uh, Virginia, gave me a, 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 a statistic earlier. He said 800,000 people a year sexually trafficked. Y'all hear that? sold into some form of slavery. Let me, let me, matter of fact, I want to get this up so I can make sure I quote him correctly. Now this would be the time where my uh, quote little Facebook thing don't want to work right. Somebody else told me, uh, Sister Flor- Floridia Jackson, she said, we can't act like sex trafficking doesn't take place in America. 
and that if we really wanted to talk about this, we would have to talk about it from the standpoint of what impact this has on the way we see the world locally, not just globally. I want to pull some of these uh, comments up. They really were helping me as I was trying to think through some of this stuff. Uh, is that it? Yeah, yeah. Loridia Jackson says, can we honestly have this conversation, the one we're trying to have right now, without discussing one, that this has happened in large numbers this time, but it happens regularly, and it is probably going to happen again. Two, to Emmett's point about the capitalistic stuff, there is a market for this madness. The leader of the Islamic militant group announced by video that he planned to sell these young girls into marriage. Listen to the language. He gonna sell them into marriage, which lets you know right off that there's some form of understanding of marriage where women don't have a right to choose whether they wanna be a part of it or not. Guess how much he say we're gonna sell them for? $12, $12. So you talk about devaluing the life of people of color. This is again why I think we haven't said much about it. Floridia said many of these girls will be sold as domestic workers in Europe. And also, to your point again a little bit, Emmett, the BBC and the French news media reported these stories a little bit differently than the American media. The American media hadn't really said much about the religious element at work out of the 300 girls total who were abducted uh, like 50 have escaped one reporter suggested that 90 percent of the girls who were captured were christian this was a christian boarding school and 90 percent of the 50 that escaped were islamic now, I do want to verify something though, Emmy. There is a misconception that Allah is different from the God of the Old Testament. Islamic faith tradition and Christian faith tradition are two of three faith traditions traced back to the exact same person, Abraham. Father Abraham had many sons, many sons, right? So there is a certain misconception that they, the Muslims, worship a different God and therefore, not, not to say that there is not tension between Muslims and Christians, not just in Africa or in different parts of the country, but you know, even in, in America, even in Memphis, right? That there's a particular type of tension around it. But I'm not sure that that is the, the uh, thread that weaves this story together for us. I, I'm coming to the concept of Jesus is black, but, but I did want to highlight that that black family, I mean, the, the uh, black uh, devaluing of life piece, the fact that several people are sold into slavery is almost commonplace, that there is a market for this, that this is a business. And Floridia went on to say, what about the stolen, peddled, pimped little black girls of color in Memphis? So this is not just over there, this is right at our doorstep. I want to pull up for you the, uh, the comment from Tim Conhouse. I want to give you the statistics. Some numbers to ponder, Dr. Conhouse said. A estimated 800,000 people are sold into bondage slavery annually. Every year, almost a million people. Sold in slavery annually. We don't want to talk about it. Out of that number, 80% are women, 50% are minors, and 75% are sold into the sex slave trade. There seems to be a dominant concept that the life of young black women has no value. 
Now I know we won't say life of young black man has, has no value. I, I won't I won't disagree with that, but I am trying to get us to focus on the concept of young black life in the 21st century, especially female life, because this Nigerian thing has been setting on me something serious. So to, that was to some uh, to some of Emma's point. I also think it's interesting that we have come to see Nigeria as a third world country, but see Ukraine as a highly civilized country. The, the, the majority of people in Nigeria look like what? Us. The majority of people in Ukraine look like what? Caucasian. Yeah, the Caucasian, right? <laughs> <Once they think. laughs> right? And I just think that we are white, hardwired now to assume white is going to be more civilized and black is going to be uncivilized. So I'm wondering how, if, how it, if at all, the reclamation of a black Jesus could impact our inspiration to revalue black life instead of devalue black life. I'm gonna explain that. Maybe if we reclaim Jesus as black, the historical Jesus, with all of his political sensibilities, his social sensibilities, his religious and revolutionary sensibilities, maybe when you see Jesus as black, it's not as acceptable to allow such horrific and repulsive actions to take place while making it a side story to the soap opera style situations of race, politics, and, and economics that we usually are being bombarded with. Let me tell you what I'm saying in short. Or at least, I ain't gonna try to say it in short, I'm gonna try to say it clearly. When Jesus is white, white life seems to have more value than black life. And maybe if we reclaim Jesus as black, obviously we gonna give value to Jesus's life as our Messiah, as the Lord and the Savior. So maybe reclaiming Jesus as black can add to the way we see black life in the 21st century. What would the black historical Jesus say about the black girls in Nigeria? That's a good question, I think. And Jesus championed the inclusion of women. Jesus wouldn't be a fan of women being sold into sexual slavery. And let's be honest, this ain't new to Nigeria. This ain't new to the globe. It's, it's all kind of biblical texts that talk about women being sold into sexual slavery. The book of Esther, they lifted Esther up because she was able to woo Mordecai. Mordecai had a litany of women who came in to entertain. What kind of entertainment you think this was? To entertain him. What about Abraham? While we talk about Abraham, what does he do with Sarah in Genesis? I almost want to turn there, but I'm trying to stay focused on two particular texts. But Abraham, Genesis chapter 12, I think it is, 12 or 13. Y'all heard this story before? We talked about it several years ago when we was going through Genesis line by line. Uh, uh, Abram takes Sarah. They headed to Egypt because there's a famine in the land. Abram tells Sarah, when we get down here, you know how them Egyptians are. Lie and say you my sister, not my wife, because they're going to look at you. They're going to see you fine. They're going to try to kill me and take you. Y'all remember that? She gets there. She goes into Pharaoh's house. And a plague came on all of them. She ended up getting right back with Abram. All of the materials that Pharaoh had given to Abram in exchange for his sister, he kept. This is not new stuff. We just taught to not read into it or to not really care about it or to not really discuss it, especially not up in church. Because let, look, what does Jesus have to do with the Nigerian girls being abducted? Nothing. Well, no, I don't think that that's true at all. What does Jesus have to do with it? Number one, I think Jesus would identify with the way that these young black girls are being abused and misused. Turn with me to Luke chapter 13. Come on, Brother Alfred. When does Jesus come into, into power? Does he come into power? One year old? Uh-huh. 13 year old? It's a great question. Or 20 years old? Outstanding question. You see? Yeah. Well, uh, is he, is he uh, a, a boy <laughs> that has sexual drives, that, that, that <laughs> likes to go out and shoot marbles or whatever? <laughs> right. You see? Or dice. Right. But, but when does this age situation become a reality? I, man, that's an outstanding question. Um, I'll, I'll start by saying 
is different depending on which gospel writer you read. <laughs> For John, when would John say Jesus came into power? Even before he was born. The beginning of creation. In the beginning was the word. The word was God. The word was with God. The word became flesh, dwelt among us. He's arguing Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is the son of God that everybody has been waiting on. Jesus is the Messiah. And he was there with God in creation. So if John was arguing it, John would say, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to explain it again uh, from other perspectives too. But John would say Jesus came into the power at the beginning. Somebody like Luke. Somebody like Matthew. Especially Matthew, because we were talking about the way Matthew talks about Jesus' vulnerability as a child. Jesus ends up in Egypt, not because he told his mom and his daddy at age two or 12 months or, you know, six weeks, y'all take me to Egypt. He went because they were trying to escape Herod's wrath. So he was subject to their leadership. But after this, uh, number one, mo most people would say Jesus' ministry starts at age mm -mm. 30. 30. Yeah, most people would say Jesus' is a Jesus' ministry starts at age 30, especially after he spent 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness being tempted by the enemy. Now, but there is, a, I understand your argument around 12, because at age 12 or 13 is where he's found in the temple discussing this conversation with the scribes and the Pharisees. So we have different interpretations of when it happens the, the reason I really appreciate you lifting that up is because it tilts us back towards Jesus's humanity right in that conversation yeah that's the conversation with uh, the scribes and the Pharisees his parents go off back to Jerusalem they all went to uh, uh, yeah they, they, they went to a particular place to celebrate one of the festivals and then his parents, you know, were headed back about three days. He stayed behind. They didn't know it. And then when they got back, they basically were like, you know, what you doing acting like you all grown? <laughs> That's what uh, Dr. J. R. R. Brown said as the seven last words at St. Paul. Is that, yeah, you know, Jesus was known for doing some unorthodox stuff as a child. And then he says, you know, to his mother, did you not know I must be about my father's business? And if y'all ever read the EIV, where well, that was me and my mama, that's when my mama slapped the taste out of my mouth after I said that, right? So I think, Alfred, your question tilts us back towards Jesus' humanity. And I always believe that Jesus' humanity is a place where we identify with him more. As opposed to saying Jesus always does all the right things because he operates on almighty autopilot. He's so directly close and connected to God that he didn't really have any choices. He was just hard. This is John's argument. John would say stuff like, and Jesus knew what they were thinking, so he said thus and so. Right? So, so, so it's a little bit of a tension that the gospel writers seem to be involved in in their description of Jesus themselves. But regarding Jesus and these black girls, I want to highlight something in Luke chapter 13, starting at verse 10. Again, I'm suggesting maybe if we reclaim Jesus as black, the historical Jesus, with all of his political, social, religious, revolutionary sensibilities, it would not be acceptable to just sit back, Sister, Sister, Sister Madison, this is kind of sort of to your response. I think we got to do more than just pray for the governmental leaders to make the right decision. I'm not saying that we shouldn't pray I'm saying I don't think that that's all we should be doing is just sitting back praying. So Jesus champions the inclusion of women. Jesus' mama was a black woman around the same age as some of these girls who were being adopted. I'm assuming something. I need y'all help me. I'm assuming that when I just said Jesus' mama was a black woman around the same age as some of these Nigerian girls who were abducted, something in you tingled. Something in your soul said, wow. Because it puts a different spin or a different, it, it shines a different angle on the story in relationship to who our Jesus is that we're usually not naturally wired to consider. Am I, am I right? Now, I could be wrong and I don't have no problem with that. But I thought when I said Jesus' mama was about the same age as some of these girls 
who were abducted in Nigeria, I thought that might have struck a chord. Did it strike a chord? No? Okay. All right. Well, I wish it would have struck a chord. It struck a chord with me when I thought about it. No, it's okay. When, when, <laughs> when Mary went to see Elizabeth, uh huh. you know, she was a young, she was a young child. Yeah. I mean, I'm not a young child. Teenager. Yeah. She was a teenager, but God, who's supposed to be, well, let me take that back. <laughs> you see, God is the supreme being. Right. I'm and if we're going to have to deal with the supreme being and then deal with Jesus, mm -hmm. where does the power lie between God and Jesus as far as being right about what you're going to do with humanity in a situation like like this? Yeah. Uh, you know, are, do we, are we going to do between Allah and Allah and God uh -huh. is 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 Allah is Allah the Almighty is in other words God is supreme of all. Right. Allah believed in God. Who? Allah. No, Allah would be. Listen, listen. To what I'm about to tell you. Allah is another name for the eternal God of all creation. You got that? Right. Now, if you want to. If you want to drive a wedge between Christian faith tradition and Islamic faith tradition, start with Muhammad and Jesus. Not Allah. Start with Muhammad and Jesus. Right? We can't find out where, we know where Muhammad is. Yeah, yes, we do. Yes, we do. Look, I'm Christian. Ain't no, ain't no doubt about it. And, and I ain't got to make no apologies for that, right? And the other iron is this. <laughs> Islamics honor Jesus as a prophet. No, a, a prophet, that, that he was one of God's prophets. Yeah. Right? So it's a little bit more than just, you know, he helped old ladies across the street. <laughs> you know, I, I'm serious now, you know, and I think I, I want us to be conscious and know this, right? There are some differences, some theological differences between the way Christians understand God at work through humanity and the way Islamics understand God at work through humanity. But let's be clear about what Islamics think about Jesus. Matter of fact, not just Islamics, but several people in other faith traditions. I, I'm, I'm recalled of a statement that uh, a statement that the Dalai Lama said. I think it was the Dalai Lama. No, who did who did Dr. King get the nonviolent Gandhi? This is what Gandhi said. Gandhi said. I like your Christ, but I do not like your Christians because your Christians are so unlike your Christ. So people in other faith traditions honor the divinity of Jesus to a degree. And I'm going somewhere with this divinity of Jesus to a degree thing. What I'm trying to argue is what Jesus said, that the spirit of God that is upon me. Yes, sir is the same spirit of God that's upon you. You understand what I'm saying? Now, now we can talk, what, listen, whatever it takes for you to be secure in your salvation regarding the amount or the level of Jesus' divinity, figure it out for yourself, hold it, own it, and, and, and be sure of your salvation. Did y'all hear me? Did y'all hear what I said? Let me say it again. Whatever level of Jesus' divinity you need in your own personal life, to be sure of your salvation, you get it, you own it, you keep it. I'm going to say it again. Whatever percentage, 150, 100, 75, 55, whatever percentage of Jesus' divinity that you need to be sure of your own soul's salvation, you get it, you keep it. Regardless of the percentage, Jesus was human on earth. It helps us, I believe, to come to see Jesus as a human being inspired by God that had to do all of the wrestling and struggling and grinding to live out God's will in his life like all of us do. Oh yeah, oh yeah. It, 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 so I don't find, I know some of my 
uh, you know, some of our brothers and sisters in the faith may find this almighty autopilot. <laughs> I, I, I don't find it. I find Jesus mad, frustrated, uh, you, know, you know, hungry, thirsty, you know, all of these things. Uh, and, and even if it ain't listed, I think Jesus struggled with something. It ain't listed that he had uh, hormonal urges. But if he was fully human, he had hormonal urges. He had to have a bowel movement. Now, nowhere in the text does it say, and Jesus went to the bathroom. But we all pretty much know he went to the bathroom, right? So, let me come back to the, what does Jesus think about young black women? His mama was a young black woman. Obviously, he would be in love with his mama. And Jesus would likely identify with the oppression of minority women. And Jesus would work to liberate minority women from their oppression. Luke chapter 13. Somebody start at verse 10. On the Sabbath, Jesus was teaching and wondering in the synagogue. Y'all see what's going on? Real simple so far. Jesus in the synagogue teaching. Come on. And the woman was there who had been crippled by the spirit for 18 years. Y'all see that? Now don't confuse her with the woman with the issue of blood for 12 long years. Okay? He was bent over and could not straighten up at all. Y'all see the image? So she's humped over, cannot stand up straight. How long? So she's at least, at least 18 years old. She's been dealing with this for a while. Now, what would you do today if you had an ailment, or let's just call it a handicap like that, and you had been dealing with it that long, what would you do? You would, thank you, do about the, the ailment, the handicap, the, the, you know. You would go to the doctor, right? And what would you say when you went to the doctor? This, okay, so, so you tell the doctor your situation. Now, the mere fact that we would say we would go to the doctor lets us know that we have certain things that we have been conditioned to assume would be helpful. Now, what do you need today to go to the doctor? It helps to have health insurance. What if you don't have health insurance? You'll be led to get away from. That's if you inclined to go at all. Yeah. My tooth woke me up at 3.30 in the morning the other night. <coughs> True story. My tooth was aching so bad, right here, so bad, it woke me up 3.30 in the morning. Denise was like, what's wrong with you? I said, man, I have a toothache. Did, have I been to the dentist? No. You know why? No, oh, okay. So just, just case in point, we less inclined to go if we don't have that type of insurance. I'm raising this because if she's been dealing with this for 18 years, chances are she don't have the money to see that. Now, if you want to compare this to the story of the woman with the issue of blood for 12 long years, the text in that story says... She spent everything she had on the doctors and didn't get better. She got worse. All right? Come on, John. We're back to coaching. Read. <laughs> okay. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Now, press pause. What just happened that was really interesting? Baby says, you want to say something? Well, no, I don't I don't see I don't see that because before he calls her, it says she could not straighten up at all. Okay. But when he said, Woman, come here. Uh-huh. Okay, by the time she gets to him, she's already straightened up. Read verse 13. Go ahead, read verse 13. Then he put his hands on her. Uh-huh. Immediately she straightened up and prayed to God. Okay, so before he put his hands on her. She still bent. She, yeah, she, she probably still bent, right? But good. You know, yeah, digging it like that. Make sense of it like that, right? Notice, she didn't ask him 
to heal her. Maybe I should preach this one of your Sunday. She didn't ask him to heal her. Jesus looks, sees a sister that's dealing with a infirmity, something that's keeping her from living how in Jesus' mind God would have her to live. She didn't ask him to help. And he didn't say, you know what, I'm going to just pray for her. I'm going to pray that the Lord would send her a loving doctor. Or that Jesus, Jesus didn't pray that the Roman government would pass the Affordable Care Act. So she would have easier access to a doctor. He saw her. Now, I always love when the Bible says, and he saw her. That always does something to me. He saw her and spoke to her and said, you set free from your infirmity. Then what? <laughs> Woo! Now, if this was a real Baptist church, real Baptist churches tear the church up when you say he touched me. And oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened. And now I know he touched me and made me help. I think this is where the, the, the song came from, right? But notice you got a woman who is automatically in this environment a second class citizen probably poor without many resources which is why she's been dealing with this for 18 years Jesus thinks enough of her to help her maybe Jesus seen his mama in her or his sister in her Yeah, I know. You read ahead. So you think you slipped. Yeah, you, now, look. You think I didn't know that he healed on the Sabbath? You, you think I was done? Look, I really didn't read all. I didn't really get us to read all of that for that part. It was just so good. I couldn't help but, you know, teach it, right? This is not that. It's where when we, in our Bible, it says a crippled woman healed on the Sabbath. Oh, I got it. Okay, you just read it. See, yeah, that's why I don't like the, the, the subheadings. They try to tell you what the, what the good part is. See? Now, I just gave you a good part, and we ain't even got to the Sabbath part yet, right? See? No, no. Thanks, baby sister. Here's what I really want us to get to. Here's what's really interesting to me. Verse 14. Right after she straightens up. Praises God, brother boy. Right? Like we want our young black girls to do. Let's just say she in her mid-20s. Fair? Dealing with the issue for 18 years. Tarver, she about 25. You can date her now because Jesus just healed her. <laughs> the synagogue ruler got, got mad. This is one of the most disturbing responses to somebody's healing I ever heard before, and it sounds real familiar. Verse 14 Indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. Now, why, why they mad? Not that she got a healing. He mad that he healed her on the wrong day. Now, see, y'all think when I be saying that when I'm preaching, y'all think I be making this stuff up. Here it is right here. This is what he said. This is Jesus on the main line. She's going to tell him what she wants. Yeah, that's what he's trying to tell the officials right now. Turn those girls over. <laughs> look, at what, look at what the synagogue ruler said. There are six days for work. Come and be healed on those days. Don't be, yeah, I mean, look, that's in your Bible too, unless you tore it up. Tore it out, right? How many people, this is your first time hearing it? Reading it. Yeah, y'all heard this before? This man said, basically, the church's business hours are from nine to five, Monday through Friday. If you get sick, at any time other than that, you need to wait and come back during regular business hours. Not, not, <laughs> they had no 911 in, right? Now, now, earlier I said reclaiming Jesus' political, social, 
and religious revolutionary sensibilities would help us, right? Do you think Jesus knew it was the Sabbath day? Huh? Yeah. Huh? Oh, 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 okay. So it seems as though the reason we ignore certain people in certain places that go through certain things is because we've been taught to lift up certain technicalities as more important than the people who are subject to the circumstances that them technicalities put them under. For instance, should it make a difference if the young girls were Muslim or Christian? No, we shouldn't care. Should it make a difference whether the people who captured them were Muslims or Christians? No, we shouldn't care. Do it make a difference whether they were black or white? No, we shouldn't care. That's dealing with the technicalities. Let's deal with the real issue. It's wrong. That's what I like about Jesus. Now we're talking about reclaiming him. See, now let me tell you like this. I'm finna give you, I'm finna show you my hand. It's hard to read a white pacifist Jesus in this text. When they give us the white Jesus, they give us the white pacifist Jesus. You know, the humble, meek, and mild. You know, the kumbaya Jesus. Does this look like a kumbaya Jesus? Look at Jesus' response to what the synagogue ruler had to say. Hypocrite! And let me tell you something. You can think that that sounds like good casual language if you want to. Right. You hypocrite! Vulgar in Jesus' day. Don't you call no synagogue ruler no hypocrite. Jesus says, don't y'all on the Sabbath day untie I'm coming to you, Emmett. I'm coming to you. You brought up capitalism, didn't you? You talked about the market for it, right? Yeah. How much money did the synagogue make off girlfriends healing? Nothing. Nothing. Look at what Jesus said. Don't y'all untie y'all ox or y'all dunk. That's property, right? Yeah. From the stall, take it out and give it water on the Sabbath. Then look at what he said. Then should not this woman, listen to this, if you want to see her as a black woman, what Jesus called her? <laughs> he puts her in the ancestry of Abraham. Shouldn't she, who Satan has kept bound for 18 years? Maybe I should unpack that Satan thing. You think he's talking about the devil? Yeah. I don't think so. I think he's talking about the system that keeps people oppressed. He didn't say, the, well, never mind. I don't got I don't, I don't. It was a physical condition, not a mental condition. What? Her bed was a physical condition. How, yeah. was the, how was the establishment responsible for that? Why didn't she have access to health care? Why didn't she have money? Why are they upset about her being healed on the Sabbath day? Why are these technicalities making a large difference to people who need God's intervention and help? That's the system I'm, that's the system I'm talking about. In that about. day, they didn't have a set of health care of anyone. It, it, it yes, on you did. Yeah, no, yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. I agree. Amen. What Joy said. Well, some people were born into money, some were not, just like it is today. Some have, some do not. Some come, come on, help, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, whatever. Let the church say amen. amen. Yes, I agree with you. No, that, I mean, that's exactly the point that I'm trying to make. And the Jesus that many of us have been introduced to is the Jesus that don't respond like this. That's the white Jesus. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. The white so possible Jesus. The concept Jesus. of the white and the black Jesus is to do with how the white establishment treat the black. Is that your concept of a white Jesus? Yes, ma'am. And the black Jesus is the concept of how black life is and how we live and what we have to do and endure and all that. And, and how, not just that, yes, that's part of it. That's the identification part of it. Okay. But there's also an implementation part of it, too. What about the spiritual part? Of it? Do you have a spiritual difference between a black and white Jesus? Yes. What is that? So, the, the white Jesus spiritually is somebody who, yes, thank you, Lord, somebody who is ultimately concern, concerned with 
your soul salvation and you making it to heaven in the that's afterlife. The white that's the white, the white one. That's the white. Okay. Yeah, the white one is ultimately concerned with the eternal afterlife. I'll come back to John chapter 3 and what Jesus says about eternal life and all of that stuff. Notice I was saying son of God, that's a real convenient white Jesus concept. Son of man is more the black Jesus. See, the black Jesus is concerned about how God's spirit dwells with us here on earth to inspire us to work against crazy stuff like this but in Luke chapter 13, ma'am. No eternity afterwards. No, it's an eternity. It's, it's an yeah, eternity. yeah, there's an eternity afterwards too. The, the eternity afterwards for me, and I think for the Jesus as it is portrayed in the text is, God has that under control. That's the black Jesus or the white one? The black Jesus believes that God has eternity under control okay. and that we can access God's eternal love by doing God's physical, tangible, God has no hands but mine, God has no eyes but it, right? So that's what the black Jesus is about. The, the black Jesus wants you to, the, uh, to, to God. the black Jesus want us to get up off our blessed assurance and stop with just sitting, now listen hear what I'm about to say. Black Jesus, I believe, likes us shouting and dancing and being free to worship in church and likes equally, if not more for us to go outside the church doors and be God in the earth, especially in places like Nigeria or places in Memphis where there are young black girls being abducted and, and sexually trafficked. So yeah, I, yes, yes, Sister Joyce, I think you are summarizing the different nuances between the white Jesus and the black Jesus for me. The white Jesus is a pacifist, one that just prays about it and sings all of the sweet songs and then comes to church and, and, and doesn't, you know, don't hang with them and don't do that. No, 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 especially not in situations like this. And I think that that's the white Jesus. Yeah, that doesn't. Yeah, that doesn't do. And I think that black Jesus is out riding, having not cried, marching or whatever. Yes, Lord. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Out there, in there, doing down in the. Yes. Community. Uh, yes, Lord. All over. You look. Now you need to get you a Bible study and teach this thing. Yes. What you saying? Yes. Uh, could I make a comment? Sure. When I was growing up, and uh, you know, being brought in the church and taught as a child and growing up in the church, I didn't really have a concept of black and white Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, black and white God, we were just told God was supreme power and you know, spiritual. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I didn't have a concept of what he was black and white. Mm -hmm. I saw the pictures they printed, but it didn't face me, not really. I, I, I thought it was just a picture. I hope you're right. I'm gonna take your word for it. No, you but know, I know that's just saying that's the way I feel. Yeah, I got it. I got it. So, and that's exactly why I'm not trying to discredit or no, minimize the no man never saw him to know in today's world know what he looked like physically anyway so that's their concept right but the concept is a byproduct of the images that have been force fed to us I follow you. and the force feeding of the way now it may not have been that for you so, I, so I'm gonna a man you and I'm praying it may not be your story but somebody's story is the reason I don't deal with that church or them church folks yeah, is because they up in there worshiping that white Jesus and there are a whole lot of people in the faith that are using white Jesus as a reconstructed concept from the Roman government that was trying to calm down all of those poor peasant Hebrew people who were revolting like Jesus did. And so they shift the image. And so now the people in Rome who are responsible for circumstances and situations like this become the people who feel justified in the system of oppression that they have created because the Jesus that saves everybody's souls and gets you into heaven looks just like them and acts just like them. What, what is somebody who is not being impacted directly by some of these horrific circumstances going to be compelled to do about them? Probably nothing. So when I'm saying I'm reclaiming the black Jesus, first, don't miss this. I'm reclaiming the biblical Jesus. This is the Jesus of the Bible. This is the historical Jesus. I'm not just saying, see, this, 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 this idea 
that Jesus is racially null, that he don't have no race. Now, we can say God, the supreme entity in the universe, is not a human being, does not have a race, does not have skin, does not have the color, all of that. I, I'm with that. I believe in God. I pray to God. I worship God. I follow Jesus. <laughs> Y'all listen to me. And the Jesus I follow is the Jesus of Nazareth that I have encountered in my own life and in these sacred texts. And that Jesus, based upon the portrayal of Jesus in these texts, I'm able to identify with. It motivates me to try to live like him. I struggle like him. I get frustrated like him. I cry like he did. I bleed like he did. And I'm going to work for justice like he did. And if he sees this black woman being bound by an evil system, and even without her asking him, she might not even. See, this ain't one of them stories where they say they heard that Jesus was coming to town, and then they go search Jesus out to get the healing. This ain't that. She ain't asked him to help her. He just knew she needed some help, and he could do something about it. <clears throat> yeah, and that's what we should be doing. I'm putting something together tomorrow. Just trying to put something together tomorrow. Bunch of I, I seen a I seen an image today. Tarvis, you see this Facebook image with the uh, some of the white actors? I think it's Bradley Cooper, a couple more. You see this image? They got this sign. Let me pull it up for you. They got this sign <coughs> where they are. Uh, you know, they're trying to champion revolting against the the uh, this right here. Here's the, here's the image. It says, real men don't buy girls. Y'all see that? See that? See this right here? Can everybody see that? Can y'all see that? So it's a poster that says, real men don't buy girls. Of course, this is in response to the sexual trafficking of the Nigerian girls. And I liked the idea, but then I seen, and this is no objection. I, you know, I like Ashton Kutcher, I like Justin Timberlake, and I, and I can't think of this other brother's name. Sean, <laughs> Sean, Sean Penn. Yeah. So I like I, I like all of them. I think they're good guys, as far as I know, right? But we talking about young black girls in Africa. So I think it should be some black men who hold up a similar sign, and that sign need to go viral. Because I'm mindful, or I'm sensitive to what it seems like. Who the people who gonna help them poor black girls in Nigeria? Who gonna help? The white man. I ain't saying that the white man ain't gonna help. Amen. White man, help, please. Right? White woman, help, please. Black woman, help, please. Well, so I'm I'm putting something together that you know this. this is, my faith tells me get involved. Pray, yes, Lord, I'm praying. Yes, Lord. Teach, preach, do all of that. And sometimes, you know what this made me think about? You, you, i tell you what this situation made me think about. Them young black girls being sold into slavery. Sex slavery. It made me think about women over here in Tennessee, in Memphis sold into sex slavery. Let's just say, I asked uh, one of my homeboys on Facebook this. I said, let's just, because we were having this conversation about Amendment 1. Y'all remember me talking about Amendment 1? Part of what Amendment 1 does is say, if a woman has a child and she was using drugs during her pregnancy, she can be criminalized for that. Okay? I thought to myself, this is before I got all of the numbers, women sold into sexual slavery. Y'all might know, oftentimes, when you are a sexual slave, the slave master makes you use drugs, whether you want to or not, to get you to more readily consent to the sexual activity. The young black girl develops an addiction, I'm hypothetically speaking, young black girl develops an addiction, right? At some point gets pregnant, whether it be consensual or against her will, maybe even raped by the slave, right? 
has a baby, she hooked on the drugs, ain't in a clear state of mind, we yeah. ain't set up all of these, we ain't, we ain't put all of these funds in place to give sisters like that adequate treatment for their drug habits, but she gonna have a child now after having sex against her will, after being sold into sex slavery, and then after she had a child, guess what they gonna do? They gonna take the child and throw her in jail. Now what's the image of that girl you just had in your mind? Yeah. I thought, I'm thinking, look, I'm trying to connect these dots. People of faith need to be trying to connect these dots. All of us who are spiritual, we need to be trying to connect these dots. This is bigger than just getting people in the sanctuary. We should do that because this should be the place where we're able to talk about this stuff, discuss this stuff, and get enlightened about this stuff, and disagree sometime, and push back and forth, and argue and fuss, and all of that stuff, and then ultimately say, this is what we're going to do to help our people. It's going to have to take place here. Well, it's bigger than just lifting a holy hand, singing good. It's bigger than whether we sing hymns or contemporary songs. It's bigger than whether we wear jeans or, or suits and ties and shirts. It's bigger than whether we have communion on the first or Thursday. It's bigger than all of that stuff. See, I said this the other day to somebody. It's easy to have ideas and theology and be talking all of this, you know, high-minded stuff when your ideas and your theology ain't connected to nobody's blood. But when you when, when you facing people in your neighborhood or in your family that deal with bloody situations and what you think and what you say and how you pray and how you move may affect whether or not they end up getting some bloodshed, then that changes the way you see stuff. Now we can sit up in here and argue about whether Jesus was, you know, <laughs> we can do all we want to. I'm telling you, at the end of the day, this stuff has to have some teeth to it. You know, I, I, my prayer as your pastor is that your faith has some skin, to, some flesh to it, some blood to it, some sweat to it, some tears to it. And I trust and believe, Sister Joyce, if you got a faith like that, oh, heaven is going to be glorious. But in the meanwhile, while we talking about eternity and while we saving souls, thanks be unto God for it. I think we need to save some of them bodies that's attached to some of them souls too. We're going we gonna to pray for the salvation of the Nigerian girls who were abducted. And God going to save their soul. And one of them, one of them trifling men going to be taking their body. We're going to be up in here on Sunday talking about glory, glory, hallelujah, since I laid my burdens down. Yes, baby sister, then brother Alfred. All right. Scientists say that those girls, mm -hmm. they're moving them. They're in a... Um, Concentration camp of sorts. Well, yeah, but I mean, there's a lot of trees and forests and stuff. So, I mean, even if you sent in... Say two thousand people, two thousand men to go in there and rest them. They probably won't be there when they get there. Emmett probably could speak to this better than me. Our military has very sophisticated technology. Yeah, I know. So I'm not expecting us. I'm not saying, brother boy, we're gonna raise an offering this Sunday. We're gonna rent a private jet. We're going to get Emmett's gun, John's gun, my gun, and y'all gun. We're going to get them girls out next Monday. No, that's not, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying we need to be mindful of it. We need to be discussing it. And where we can, we need to try to do something about it, even if that just means be mindful. You know, so hopefully next time you see, next time you riding down Lamar, or you over there by the belt line, or you over there off of Mississippi, and you see somebody walking and it look like they working, you know what I just said. Mm -hmm. Did y'all did y'all hear what I just said? Yes, yeah, they working. Soliciting. Yeah. Solid. yeah. Then maybe you maybe you can call the law. They, they, they may not ever show up. 
But at least you won't be blind and ignorant to it. Well, yeah, you know. But they come out too late for me to be out here. Look, well, I'm gonna I'm lean on Sister Madison for this then. At the very least, be praying. At the very least, be praying. Think about this stuff. Talk about this stuff. Talk to Kavita. Talk to Catherine. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. It's something we could do. It's something we could do. So that's that's what I'm saying. I, I'm glad you brought that up. I ain't saying we finna <laughs> we, no, we finna we finna fly the chopper over there well, next week, baby. We going to get them girls. They will shoot our stuff down. We be, look. We be broke. Roof be caved in and everything. And the and the girls still be on it. This is one time I would like to do some bodily harm. Yeah, I understand. I understand, brother. Brother Alfred. Uh, when when uh, we are confused and we need some answers and we are being informed to ask and the answers will come. Jesus gave us the, the Holy Spirit and told us that this situation would occur. And when it occurred, being of all, it didn't matter whether or not you were Islamic or whatever, all of them heard. And this was not a guess. This was a reality that all heard this which implies that a master supreme individual through, through Jesus came into existence. And so when we want answers, we've been instructed to ask. Mm -hmm. And that if we ask in the right, not, not if we ask, not in what frame of mind, yeah. that the answers will come. The answer, we don't know whether the answer is yes or no. Right. But the answer will come. And if we believe that this Messiah, this promised individual, and, and, and Jesus was the one that died, went through the situation, came out and says, okay, you know, when you need some help, or when you need some understanding of something, Ask and it shall be given. You say, knock and the door shall be open. That this knocking and all of these knockings and asking and everything came from a supreme being. So, what we want to ask us to, what are we going to do about them little girls over there? Who do we consult? We start by consulting God, right? right. That's what we did. We come together as a community of faith. And we consult each other. And it doesn't matter what faith you are, whether right. you're nah. Islamic or whatever. Right, no, nah. no, nah. now nah, look, and, and I'll be honest with y'all, I don't expect all y'all to go out tomorrow and find a, a, a Islamic brother or sister to be in conversation with. But be clear, in moments like these, we're going to come together and discuss this type of stuff. So I'm talking about this particular community of faith. Y'all know, we all should know that whoever wants to come up in here is welcome to come up in here and join us in this conversation. This ain't, this ain't an exclusive closed door meeting. So yes, when well, we start with God, then we discuss amongst ourselves, and we take the information that we've been given and apply it to our individual lives. That's why I said something about Amendment 1. Maybe, maybe you can't you know, say nothing to them girls over there, right? Maybe you can't do nothing but pray. But if you're of age, you can vote. You understand what I'm saying? If you got a phone and, and you see it, you know, there are tangible grassroots street corner ways to be involved, to put your faith in action, to live your faith out loud. And I believe that that is our responsibility and divine mandate. That's the church I believe God calls us to be. It doesn't mean we don't have all of the answers. It don't mean that we're going to 
we're gonna pray to God. You know, you said a minute ago, you know, you, you ask God, the answer might be yes, might be, might, might be no. So you pray to God, and God says yes, and all of us pray to God, and God says yes. We come together, we decide what we're gonna do, we're gonna we gonna uh, overturn amendment one, right? And then then six years later, it still ain't overturned, and then we have to say, you know what, maybe we did, but but at least we did something. We, get, we gave God the opportunity to work a miracle through us. Well, the, um, our Savior that we were following, Jesus Christ, he was active. He didn't just sit and talk. If that was the only thing, we would not have all this in the Bible about what he did physically and got in the So we faith. So, so let us. That shows this life in it. So let us live our faith in such a way that somebody would write a Bible about us. Hello, somebody. My prayer, read the mission statement. Read the mission statement. See what God is calling us to. A congregation that actively lives out our faith. Let's stand.